Hello, everybody, and welcome to Casa Aid USA's second webinar in our mental health series. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We are very excited to have an incredible group of panelists with us um, um, for this much needed discussion on mental health and well being. So, before introducing our panelists, I'd like to inform you of the setup for today's webinar. So, please note that you will be automatically muted as you join, as well as your video switched off. Um, but while this is the case, we would love to hear any thoughts, questions, or comments you may have. So please feel free to use the chat box at any time through the duration of today's webinar. The last 15 minutes are reserved for a Q&A session. And in this session, you'll be able to view everyone's questions. You can vote for those that you wish to be answered, as well as add in your own anonymously if you prefer. And as time permits, the panelists will respond. So now to introduce our panelists in no particular order, Welcome Sandeep Panasar, a member of Taraki, an advocacy organization for Punjabi communities and an assistant psychologist and mental health coordinator at the University of Birmingham. Next, please welcome Sahaj Kohli, founder of Brown Girl Therapy, the first and largest mental health and wellness community organization for children of immigrants, bicultural identity exploration and destigmatization of therapy in immigrant communities. Welcome Sadie Sutton, who was inspired by her own experiences with depression and anxiety to create the She Persisted podcast, a platform to empower other teens. From Women of Color Therapy, we have with us Pavan Kaur Basra, a mental health therapist and empowerment coach, as well as our moderator Tamika Lewis, a writer, speaker and mental health expert. Thank you all so much for being here with us today from all over the USA and from the UK as well. Now over to you, Tamika, thank you. You're on mute, Tamika. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, thank you so much, Sasha. And I'm so excited to um, dig into this conversation with such amazing panelists and learn more about the, all the work that you guys are doing. Um, I wanted to let our viewers know that we're going to be raising a lot of really important topics around mental health. And our conversation isn't, you know, meant to replace therapy, what, what we do hope to um, open everyone up more to the idea of, of seeking support. And we will be providing resources at the end um, of, of the um, webinar. And so I wanted to just jump in by asking everyone to share about the communities that you work with and specific mental health challenges that, that you know, those communities um, are dealing with. Um, I can go ahead and start. Um, so I'm Sadie, um, I'm 18 and I'm from the Bay Area. Um, I host a podcast called She Persisted, which is predominantly directed at teenagers and then secondarily people in teens communities. So parents, teachers, um, other family members, classmates um, looking to support individuals navigating mental health challenges. Um, so teens experience lots of things. The Probably the first that I would identify with just being um, overwhelmed by emotions, which could, can then secondarily kind of lead into depression and anxiety. Um, social anxiety, all of these other things, um, but really um, emotion regulation, um, finding healthy connections, building relationships, maintaining stress. Um, so yeah, really predominantly teenagers looking to improve their mental health, whether they're struggling with mental illness or not, um, and then as well, individuals in their communities. Thank you. I'm happy to go next. Okay. So um, that sounds really great, Sadie. So um, so um, I work with an organization called Daraki. So Daraki is, um, there's no real direct translation, but the, the word kind of means looking forward to a bright future. Um, and we, um, uh, as an organization, predominantly serve the Punjabi community. So we have, um, we run uh, monthly forums, uh, a separate one for males, uh, separate one for females. Um, and the idea is that we put on a different topic each month um, and whether that be uh, focusing on um, low mood and depression, whether it be um, addiction, alcohol, um, or even just a space to chat about what we've all been facing over this year and a bit, year and a bit. 
Um, so um, those are all available on Eventbrite to join. Um, so we have also got a great partnership with an organization called Sarbuck, which is for individuals who identify as LGBTQ plus um, and a Sikh. And again, is a safe space to kind of discuss um, and, and put on events which can kind of engage that, uh, the, the community too. Um, so we essentially open up a space for individuals to connect and talk about the topic that we've been that we host, um, in which most cases um, ends up being a wonderful peer to peer support session, which us as a facilitators kind of help people to to um, uh, engage in a conversation. Thank you, Sandy. Hi, everyone. My name is Pavan. I am the associate director and therapist at Women of Color Therapy. Our um, population, we really gear towards working around uh, a lot of women who uh, have anxiety, depression, self-esteem, and a lot of conversations around racial and cultural injustices and healing. Um, we currently have a team of six therapists, and we've noticed across the, the past year that a lot of women in color struggle a lot with boundaries, assertiveness, body image, codependency, perfectionism, and overall just engaging in self-care. So now what we are going to do is we're creating a community with women of color, as well as a wellness hub in Sherman Oaks, California, where we will now have a team of therapists for our clients, as well as a massage therapist, um, a registered dietitian, and other wellness practitioners. So it'll be really exciting stuff coming up. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Sahaj. Um, I am the founder of Brown Girl Therapy, but I'm also a former journalist and um, a mental health therapist in training. And so I like to say that my passion lies at the intersection of narrative storytelling and mental health advocacy. Brown Girl Therapy is a platform for um, all children of immigrants. It started initially as a platform for South Asian children of immigrants in the West, hence the name. But as I started creating content and um, pursuing graduate school and trying to democratize research for the immigrant communities, I realized how much of an overlap there is amongst all children of immigrants, even though we are not um, a monolith at all. Uh, there are three uh, specific things that I see across the board in the work that I've been doing for the last two years with Brown Girl Therapy um, when it comes to the mental health for children of immigrants. So there's gratitude, guilt, and grief. And so for a lot of children of immigrants who are growing up in um, a country that has different cultural or value systems and the ones that their parents grew up with, there can often be um, this guilt of feeling like maybe they're not enough. They're not um, acting in a way that their parents want them to act. They're not pursuing things that their parents want them to pursue. Um, and with that can come a lot of gratitude shame as well, where a lot of children of immigrants might feel like their parents may have endured a lot of things that were worse than what they can ever possibly experience. Uh, this stops them from speaking out, asking for help. This stops them from feeling like their feelings or their mental health matters. And so there's a lot of this shaming of that we do of ourselves when we are feeling like we are hurting or struggling. And I think um, that's the second thing that I really see. And then the third one is grief. And so um, especially now with guilt and grief, um, you know, generally I see children of immigrants struggling with both guilt and how they're acting when it comes to their different cultural systems and grief with feeling like they are um you know, don't have as much access as maybe their counterparts and their and, and their peers in, in the countries that they live in to their extended family, to their roots, to their identity. But now with everything that's happening across the around the world, in the United States, in the UK, everywhere, um, there's especially this thriver's guilt of feeling like, you know, for me, for instance, growing being in America and seeing that everything is opening back up, um, and then seeing what's happening in India, there's this thriver's guilt that that a lot of Indians might be feeling, a lot of Indian children of Immigrants. And then there's this disenfranchised grief of feeling like um, they don't know how to talk about it. They don't know how to access the support because they're not the ones who are dealing with it primarily. So uh, that's generally what I see. It's a little bit about me and I'm really excited for this conversation with you all. Thank you, everyone. Um, so, you know, oftentimes we think about the pathology in mental health, you know, kind of the symptoms of what looks wrong. Um, but I'm curious to know, what is the picture of health? Like what, what does well-being look like for the in the communities that, that you all serve? I think an important one that we particularly find in um, with the Rocky is um, spirituality um, and religion comes a lot into it. And I think a lot of people when um, 
are kind of suffering with any mental health issue or, or, or struggling generally and just facing challenges they turn a lot to um to their god to spirituality and kind of it kind of brings back home a reason and a purpose as to why they're here um so i think a lot of well-being in terms of I mean, across a lot of the forums that we have been running, we found that across the pandemic, there have been increases in anxiety and low mood. Um, and there's particular groups that we're very much um, geared towards targeting at the moment. And that's particularly elderly people. Um, I think there's been a lot of isolation for a lot of elderly people over the pandemic, whether that be fear from going outside, shielding, but also language around mental health in, in the Punjabi language. I mean, there isn't much that does exist other than the words bargal, which means mad, um, or, um, um, or it's a work of black magic or the devil. So I think there's a lot of stigma and a fear around well-being and mental health, particularly in the Punjabi community. And it's one of those whereby we're kind of hoping to um, have advocates within various generations across the Punjabi community whereby actually they break down that stigma um, and and bring religion and spirituality into it as part of developing a language around what is anxiety, what is depression, what is isolation, because these are things and real feelings, but in the Punjabi language there aren't real words to express that. Um, and I think uh, the, the differences even between males and females is the real cultural expectations. And I think in the Punjabi community, there tends to be a lot of um, real um, push and strive to find the next best thing or be the best at something different um, or get ahead. And I think the pandemic has kind of put a pause on that. And people aren't comfortable with pausing, reflecting and looking on their life and thinking, actually, I really appreciate what I have now. I've had, you know, uh, I've had some downtime. Um, I've had some time to reflect, but there's the cultural pressures to continue on, which then evokes um, even more anxiety, low mood. Um, and, and particularly with us, we found that there's been an increase in alcohol consumption over lockdown. So that's, again, something that we really want to do, start to tackle. Yeah, um, so <laughs> Yeah, I think as far as from the teen demographic, going back to the pathology, you see a lot of um, things related to school and other commitments when attendance struggles, when engagement and family relationships struggles, those are normally the warning signs. So while um, the picture of health um, for, for teens is extremely subjective, I would say um, for the most part, it's really feeling competent in your ability to balance your, your various commitments, whether that's school, extracurriculars, um, big things in your life, whether that's college applications, moving away, um, engaging in healthy relationships with your family, peers, um, other adults in your life, um, and feeling really confident in your ability to kind of do each of those things and not be consistently bogged down by anxiety or depression or low mood, stress, whatever that looks like for you. So I think for teens, it's really being able to navigate all of those different aspects of life and feeling really connected and supported um, and, and confident in their ability to do that, which is super closely linked to self-esteem, um, motivation, um, all of these things, which of course carry on into adulthood. But from that baseline point, building those habits to, to set kids up for success um, in, in college, graduate school, working full-time, all of those things. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sadie. Yeah. Oh, Bob, then you go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to jump in because, you know, I think as some, as a woman of color who has entered the mental health field from the other side, but I've also pursued my own therapy, my own mental health care. Um, I feel like it's really hard to think you deserve quality care when the care doesn't look like you. And so a lot, you know, in the work that I do with Brown Girl Therapy is really trying to bring the community together as individuals. Um, you know, I'm trying to do that work on a macro way within the mental health field, but to meet the community where they are, to have spaces where uh, community members can talk to each other, whether like Sunday have said, that's a spiritual space, a religious space, a social media space, a peer support group. It's really important that we um, talk about the struggles that we're having um, you know, we also now know that a strong bicultural identity is a protective factor against mental health. So it's also doing that work individually to really um, get clear on what your value system is. How does it differ from your loved ones? You know, where can you find spaces that you can show up more wholly and authentically? Um, you know, 
and another thing is 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 really um, questioning this binary thinking that's really common in a lot of our communities and cultures and families is thinking that things are either this or that right or wrong bad or good and really challenging that embracing this this middle uh, because when you're bicultural and you tend to believe that things are right or wrong or bad or good then you tend to think that there's a part of you that's bad and a part of you that's good and so it's really trying to shake up that 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 way of thinking to really embrace all of the middle and and the messiness that is life and identity and embracing who we are, um, you know. As, bi as bicultural folks and children of immigrants, you know, I, I do spend a lot of time trying to highlight the intergenerational conflict, the tension that happens in these families. But when we talk about well being, when we talk about what does well being look like for children of immigrants, it's also really tapping into that generational resilience. You know, the, the narratives, your intergenerational narratives, the storytelling, the things that your ancestors have been through, you know, as a sick. Resilience is a really big part of, of, of my faith, of my family's faith, of the way that we talk about our people and what we've been through and our fight for justice. And it's really important to tap into that. So uh, those are a few ways that I think bicultural people, multicultural people and children of immigrants can really embrace themselves and well-being in general. Saj, I love that you brought up the whole idea of being okay with the in-between rather than black and white. I feel like this is something that I struggle with. I'm still working on, I work on this with my clients, just being okay with being in that gray area of life. That's just the best way to deal with things and finding balance, right? So um, another great way to tap into well-being, in my opinion, is always thinking of, am I coming from a place of inner mentor or am I coming from a place of inner child or inner critic? Too often we're engaging in negative self-talk or negative coping skills, which is not being at our higher selves. So it's, you know, we have to look at this, this whole, um, our lives as though there's other cups that need to be filled and finding balance with that, like an inner mentor would. So we have, you know, mental health, physical health, love, finances, career, um, spirituality, self-image, social life, all these, you know, amazing parts of our lives that we just need to make sure we have good balance over and that we are able to reach out for help when needed or when we need these other cups to be filled up when we feel like they're lowered so that we're always tapping into that inner mentor rather than inner critic and inner child. Yeah, that's, that's excellent, Pavan. And, you know, I, some of what you guys shared made me think about just the struggles in, in the, in the black community, you know, growing up, we did not, we, we don't openly talk about depression and anxiety and the church is a really prominent part of the community. And so um, it is about um, stepping into uh, the language of the community. You know, it, you can't kind of come with these um, very, um, uh, kind of grandiose te clinical terms, right? Like we have to find ways to immerse ourselves and, and switch into, um, what the, our communities already, already know and what they're speaking about. And I just wanted to know if anyone else wanted to comment on that, on, on really cool things that you've done to be able to, um, to spread mental health and, and awareness by making that, um, making those accommodations. Something that I, I started doing just last year with Brown Girl Therapy are these conversation clubs um, and also corporate speaking engagement. So on both sides, um, I'm encouraging people to connect with one another and, and have these spaces to feel because when we talk about mental health care, it's not only that it's hard to feel like you deserve it if you don't see it being reflected, but it's also hard to trust it even if you know someone is capable or licensed to help you when they may not understand your struggle. We, we know a lot of people of color across the board are distrusting of these systems for very valid reasons. And so it is really important to have these spaces where uh, we have someone with a little bit of privilege, a little bit of power who can come in and say, you know, hey, these are the things that you need to consider. So when I do corporate speaking engagements, I speak to, to allies in the workplace, to people who are HR managers, to people who are um, higher up, and I, I try to help them understand why they need to be more accommodating. When we think about the pandemic, one very sim oversimplified example is that so many Latinx, Black, Asian, um, South Asian people in the West are living in multi-generational households. And then we're all forced to work online, but the employees and the workspaces aren't doing their part to really be accommodating of that. And so when we talk about talking about mental health, we need to talk about mental health in the way that it's in, in a way that's intersectional and inclusive of everyone's living experiences, cultures, identities, all of these things that I feel like we still have so much, so much work to do across the board. 
I do feel like it's changing, which I'm really excited about, right? I think just us being here is an example. Um, I'm going to go off like the grid a little bit because I'm curious, you know, I've heard some of you guys talk about this idea of, you know, having to be persistent and having to be the strong person or kind of perfectionistic in, in um, our lives as a way to kind of overcompensate, right? This is something that I personally have worked towards um, dismantling because I feel like it doesn't belong to my community. These ideas of perfectionism and 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 the grind. Um, and I'm curious, maybe how each of you have worked to defy that yourselves to go against these these conventions of um, of success and and hustle uh, and and tools that you've used for your own mental health and wellness, if you feel comfortable. <laughs> My favorite, I guess, mantra we can call it is we live in a society where it's do, then you can have, then you can be. And I tell people, let's just start with be, have, and then you can just do. Just start off with just being first. That's what really matters. So productivity does not mean that you're, you know, more functioning better than others. Self-care is still pro pro productive, in my opinion. And so we just have to work on this mantra of be, have, do. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, that's such a great point. And I and I think another one is just um, just being comfortable in saying no, and just being comfortable that actually this is a stressful period of time. We have been through something entirely abnormal, something that we have never come across before, and actually, it's okay not to try to get ahead. It's okay not to continually try to study or find the next job or, or, or things like that. It's, 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 it's fine to take a step back and actually appreciate the, the time that you've, that you've had to kind of um, reflect on your year. Um, I think that that's one of the main points that I, I think coming out of the pandemic, but I think another way in which, um, as you put it, kind of defying the, the, the cultural norms or the, or the, the, the pathway that we are taught to lead. Um, I think it just takes, um, courage just to break away from the, the kind of the first bit of the pathway um, and kind of really be true to yourself and follow the path that you really want to. And it's one of those situations whereby you will thrive in a career or a lifestyle which you feel true and congruent with. And I think it's trying to take that time and space to really think, who am I? Where do I want to be? Uh, and what is it that I really truly enjoy? And I think that's what can help bring purpose and, and meaning to your life rather than following what your relatives or, or society tells you is the pathway to success. And it's, I mean, it's easier said than done, but it takes almost an inner capacity um, and also to share it with, with, with you know, friends and family you trust because um, they can often offer you that positive reinforcement. And sometimes they will look back and say, do you know what? I'd wish you, you know, I wish I had done that at your age. And that's almost that that validation that sometimes you need and you don't know exists until you start speaking out. Sadie, I want to ask you kind of piggybacking on what Santa just shared. Um, is that realistic for teens? You know, I work with teens in my, in, my, in my practice and I see they feel a lot of pressure to follow kind of the right, you know, the right path. Um, and there doesn't seem like there's the wiggle room to, to, to just do what they love, you know, and to just go the route of, um, of their passion. And so I'm curious, um, how you, well, if you could speak to that as far as teens kind of starting off. Yeah, I think this is especially relevant in the college applications world, um, because this is this path that's been laid out for for success or finding your your career path, creating your life for yourself is um, doing well in high school, applying to college, getting into college, and then you keep going down this cycle. Um, and so for me, when I approached the college applications process, I was like, okay, I've been to three high schools in three years. Um, I did a year and a half of intensive treatment. I took the second semester of my freshman year off um, and I have this podcast and talking about mental health. And so I was giving them such a unique mod podge of an application. Um, 
but it really showcased my passions and what I loved. And so, yes, there is this other side of things, which is like performing well in school, making sure that's a priority. If college is something that you want to pursue, that's important. There's certain things that we have to do, even if there's not, they're not the most enjoyable. So there's these boxes that we have to check, but I feel like really, really diving into my passions and mental health with the podcast, um, with what I wrote about in my applications, with my own personal experiences, that was what made me a really unique applicant um, and served me because they didn't have any, um, as far as I know, there weren't a lot of kids that were applying saying, hey, I've been in a year and a half of intensive treatment. This is how much I changed and improved. And I'm so passionate about it because this is what I went through. And so I am trying to help other teenagers. Um, and so I think that that concept is really true for, for lots of teens. Um, you check these basic boxes, whether it's schoolwork, ACT, SAT scores, all of this kind of stuff, and then going really above and beyond with what you're passionate about, whether that's sports, uh, student government, um, various clubs that you're in. Um, and that is what makes you unique and helps you get to this point of perfection that people are kind of trying to strive for, but that success is really, you reach that by being completely unique and different from everyone else. It's not that that um, cookie cutter like box that that you're trying to get to. It's um, what helps you stand out and what you're passionate about and what you enjoy and really taking the time to build that mastery is what also in turn helps your mental health. So I think for teens, there's not as much freedom as far as what you get to pursue. You do have these basic things that you have to um, maintain, but there's also that that opportunity to find your passions and pursue those. Um, and, and that that can really, really serve you um, within the college applications process and from a career perspective. And just, just to add to that, sorry, just to add to that as well. Um, I mean, you know, as more and more people like Sadie kind of show that you can follow your passions and have role models like her, I think we'll get more and more people, you know, you know, truly following their, their pathway. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I thought about, Sadie, when you were talking, I thought about our our parents, the, like the generational piece here, right? Because all of us on this panel, we are probably more woke when it comes to, you know, mental health and wellness. And we have all these like exciting concepts, right? Intersectionality and all these things, right? That we talk about, but our parents and our grandparents are still like in the, you know, they're kind of in the dark about these things. And so we still have this challenge of, of creating this bridge um, between our, our families um, that where we do want to be given permission to pursue our passion, but in their mind, you know, we have to, there's a legacy that we have to continue here. Um, and I'm just wondering if anyone kind of had any ideas around how to navigate that. I would love to jump in here. Um, you know, something that I wanted to add to the conversation was was just that that you know I, I work with with and for children of immigrants, and there is a, a lot of times this whether or not you're a child of immigrants, this pressure and this expectation to make your parents' choices worth it, to to do the thing that your parents wanted you to do, to to live the life that they expect of you, and I think. Um, that can just be so paralyzing and that can create so much tension and so much fear for being able to pursue the things that you might really want to do. Um, and I think it's really important. Um, you know, it took me a really long time to recognize that what the connections were between what my parents might have been through, what my parents might have experienced even in their own family systems, and connect that to the way that maybe I was raised and how I was, um, how I grew up and the behaviors and the mindsets I have now. So even before I entered the mental health field, I was doing a lot of this work of trying to unpack where a lot of my own rooted behaviors are coming from. And so this idea of, you know, perfectionism, um, maybe that's coming from a place of, you know, maybe you weren't validated or verbally affirmed unless you did something perfectly, got that A, got that award, won that medal. And then you developed these perfectionist tendencies where you feel like now the only way that you'll be loved, lovable, worthy is if you are perfect, the way that you serve other people, the way that you do your work. And that will, that will trickle into every part of your life. It'll trickle into the way that you interact with your superiors at work, with your friends, that you don't feel um, 
entirely secure with, with your romantic relationships with your parents. Um, and then these are all behaviors and patterns that we are then passed down from generation to generation. So like you said, Tamika, a lot of this work is breaking generational cycles. Um, it is, it's, it's incredibly hard. And so it's like, how do we have these conversations with our parents? Uh, one thing that I have found to be really useful um, is to address the fear for a lot, a lot of times for our parents, it's whatever it is that they are um, not moving on, are, are really rigid about, really are demanding about, it's all rooted in some sense of fear. Maybe it's because they don't understand the career that you wanna pursue. They don't understand how you'll find security or stability in that career. So you need to address that fear, especially with immigrant parents, with the population I work with. Um, you know, A lot of the fears that immigrant parents have is rooted in, are you gonna be okay when I'm gone? I moved you know, our family all the way across the world left my family behind. Are you going to be okay, children? Are you going to be okay? And so addressing that of like, this is how I'm going to be okay. This is how it makes me happy. These are the resources and the privileges that I have that you didn't have access to and reframing that as something that is actually positive and really meaningful and is going to really serve you and your future, you know, the future family line um, and having those really hard conversations to really break that down for your parents if they don't understand. Yeah, I think it's something also helpful to mention um, when working to kind of build those relationships and shift the narrative um, and, and advocate for yourself from a career perspective is the idea that we have our families of origin and then we have our families of choice and having um, a family of choice that really supports you in your in your career path and your relationships and your life choices. Um, initially, before you even go into that conversation with your parents, with whoever it is in your family that um, isn't as secure in that support, having that that resource and that support first and foremost, just so crucial. Um, so regardless of how this long term conversation goes with your parents, grandparents, whoever it is, you have individuals in your life that love and care and support you. Um, and truly do believe in your choice, whether it's career path, education, whatever that might be. And I think that's something that we forget that we have this ability to build a family of choice that reflects our values and supports us in our values and our choices. And um, it's it's a difficult thing to kind of think about that we can we can choose to create a family as we become more autonomous and independent. Um, but it's it's a very powerful thing, and it makes you even stronger and. Um, more more confident going into these conversations with parents, grandparents, whoever it is, because you have a support system that loves and sees you um, and, and will be there regardless of how this other conversation goes. I love that, Sadie, just this idea of like surrogate kind of figures, right, in our lives that, that can also play the role of the supporting parent without necessarily being the parent, right? So I'm curious about this concept of self-empowerment, self-improvement and self-empowerment, and how that plays a role in mental well-being. I'm happy to jump in. Um, so I think, you know, for a lot of us, self-empowerment, as you had said, as this conversation has been talking about, has only been um, taught to some of us in, in the context of how it will serve the community or your family or others. So the self-sacrifice, the service, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Community care is a form of mental health care. It's very essential that we have these systems um, of support in whatever way, like Sadie said, maybe it's choice, maybe it's of origin. Um, but what's really important to understand and to, to, to discern here is that communities are made of individuals. And so individual care is really important to creating the strength of the community, of creating the strength uh, behind the community care that people can get. And so um, that, that, that's how I think about self-empowerment. When I think about self-improvement, I'm a little bit wary because for the community that I serve, I understand that I am of service to a community where improvement is like always a thing. Like, how can I be the best? How can I keep going? How can I power through? And so I, I, I would say to challenge that idea that improvement needs to be about achievement or external validation. And it can be about just learning about ourselves, breaking cycles, trying new things. You know, I've been trying to pick up hobbies where um, like my husband and I will play tennis. I'm not good at tennis. And it's such a weird feeling because I also um, have subscribed to that mindset that I can only do things that I'm good at. And so it's challenging that and, and understanding that you can find joy in things and do things that may not have an end goal, may not be of a purpose for you to improve other than just finding happiness and joy. 
Yeah, I think um, from the context of my mental health journey, the idea of self-empowerment didn't come until like two years into working on myself. When I was struggling with depression and anxiety at the end of middle school, beginning of high school, I tried everything locally, whether it was group therapy, outpatient, inpatient, you name it, I tried it locally and nothing was changing. Um, And it wasn't a lack of great resources or doctors, therapists, whoever it was. Um, but I, I didn't have that, that self-empowerment, as you would say, um, to want to get better. And so when I went to residential treatment in Boston, I remember I got there and I was sitting in this room with like 12 or 13 different doctors who were going to be working with me in, in treatment. And they asked me, they're like, do you want to be here? And I was like, well, I have to be here. I can't be at home anymore because things aren't working. Things aren't changing. Um, but I don't, I don't want to be here. I don't really think it's going to work. Like I've tried this before. Um, And I truly did believe that I was destined to struggle with depression and anxiety and that I totally understand that other people could could change, they could experience a life that they really enjoyed. But I just didn't think that was in the cards for me because I started struggling from such a young age. And so um, there was that firm belief that treatment didn't work, wasn't going to work for me. And there was also this huge component of not having enough self-compassion to want to get better. So these two ideas were really intertwined. And so I remember they told me, they were like, so you can't be here unless you want to get better and you you believe that we can help you and you you can find the wisdom in in, in this specific treatment, which was dialectical behavioral therapy. Um, and so for the first time in my entire mental health journey, I not only cultivated enough self-compassion to want to live a better life for myself, even if I didn't know what that looked like or I didn't believe it was necessarily possible, I was like, okay, I have enough I can see the wisdom in this evidence-based treatment. I can trust these individuals around me to help me get there. And I want this for myself. I want myself to live a life that I enjoy and that I love and that I care about. Um, and so there was this this shift. And I think that is kind of what, what led to the self-empowerment. It was this self-compassion. It was wanting to get better. Um, and then that was the path that led to self-improvement and a complete 180 as far as struggling with depression and anxiety to being recovered. Um, but I think self-compassion is a really, really huge um, part in that journey of self-empowerment. I think from a from Taraki's perspective, I think Sahaj, you touched on a really important point about community. And I think the self-empowerment element um, really does center around communities. Um, and what we found is that what we aim to do is to equip the individuals who come to our sessions with the relevant knowledge, the relevant experiences of other people to kind of help them to feel as though they're not alone in that situation. And that in itself empowers them to go back home, back to their friends and open these conversations. And it doesn't need to be, um, a, you know, a, a, a detailed conversation with lots of jargon about depression, anxiety, for example. It literally just has to be, I am, you know, I, I feel more than equipped now to ask my friends, how are you really feeling? And that's as much as we want to get out there. We want to have people start these conversations. And what we try to, or what we do in reinforce with, with our attendees and anybody who engages with the Rocky is that you don't need to have a mental health qualification to open a conversation. We're all humans and we can go out there. And as long as you've picked up some tips and tools and strategies from um, from the resources on our website, from having one-to-one chats with us and even the peer-to-peer support sessions that we we do run, then, then you are in essence more than qualified to just ask, how are you? And almost release the burden from that other person, um, you know, if they're feeling they just want to offload that day. Um, and, and again, we, we do make it very clear then if there are um, instances where that individual may want more specialised support, then there are um, uh, a variety of resources and organisations that can really offer you the, 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 the support that you really need. And I think that slight, the self-empowerment element is slightly different from the self-improvement. And I think particularly with Punjabi communities, it always seems as though there has to be um, an element of self-improvement, um, as we were saying before, whether that be through education, through work, through family, through marriage, and um, through, through having a child as well. Um, so really, we try to make that distinction between it's okay to be who you are at this moment in time and there's no real um, rush to get to the next step but here's all of the tips and tools that you need to to um, kind of open a dialogue with somebody um, about how they're feeling. 
Yeah, I think both of these are really um, connected to the idea of vulnerability um, with improvement, empowerment, right? So most of our cultures don't really talk about vulnerability. It's always, you know, pick up, get to it, get over it, men don't cry type of uh, culture, type of views linked with our cultures. There's a great book called My Grandmother's Hands by um, Resma Menakin. And I love this portion of the book where he talks about dirty pain versus clean pain people. Uh, dirty pain people are unfortunately, I think, take up a lot of more of the society that we actually think. And it's people who have this trauma passed down or you know, something, a situation that happened that causes trauma and they're spreading this pain onto other people without, and it's all of this is a mask to avoid them from being vulnerable. And then the clean pain people are the ones that wake up and say, you know, something happened, this has been passed down to me or something happened to me. I don't wanna keep destroying relationships or putting this onto other people. It's time for me to become empowered and improve myself. So let me seek out the help that I need. And we have to keep in mind, it takes a village to, you know, to build a community and to heal. And so we come from these collectivistic cultures who talk about healing together as a collective, but yet we're not really doing that. So I think it's our job to improve and empower ourselves to, to continue looking at our cultures as though it is this community, having these great discussions, allowing us to be vulnerable with others and giving others the space to feel vulnerable with us safely um, and educating others in that way where we can build our community and tap into this village that we have been grown up we've been raised talking about and we can utilize it in a healthier way. I think that's, that's beautiful. It makes me think about how rich our communities already are with, you know, intrinsic resources and capacity and that, you know, I, as, as a, a therapist, I mean, my hope is to connect people to that intrinsic capacity to heal not only themselves, but to heal other people, right? Sandip, which you sort of touched on that we can actually help one another. Um, we don't have to necessarily be the expert. And I'm wondering if you guys can comment to, you know, what are some of those intrinsic qualities and, and skills and strengths that uh, your communities have that we can start with that they already, they already possess? I think with um, with women of color, it's great because women, we tend to really connect on a vulnerable level in a really great way. So keeping that as a community and having these, these conversations is amazing. Also, the ways that we express our emotions. One of the things I love most when I have a client who is crying in front of me um, and they go... <laughs> I say, make a noise, make it loud. Let's, let's get some, let's get some actual emotion out of there because growing up, I remember the first funeral I went to, um, and I identify as a Sikh Punjabi woman, right? So in my culture, the way we view death is very different. We wear white to our funerals. Um, when I first went to my funeral, the first ever funeral I went to, everyone was crying hysterically. And I was a child. I was, I was actually really scared hearing all these women's uh, chanting songs together and holding each other crying very loudly. It wasn't until I grew older that they were doing that as a way to release and not hold back their emotions. And I think this is something that we are lacking in Western culture is that we are so afraid of just letting out our emotions right then and there when we're feeling something. Sometimes it can come off dramatic, I know, but it needs to be, it needs to be incorporated as well into our practices here. So I admire that a lot. And I think that's something that's gonna have to be needed that we can incorporate from other cultures. I love that so much. Um, I like also, I also want to add that I think, you know, the way that we come together as communities that that, you know, mental health providers and individuals can can really hone in on that intrinsic healing. So it's not just when, you know, when we think about Western mental health care, it's, it's going to this place, a blank room, meeting with someone one on one or in a group in a room with with white walls and you're all sitting in a chair and that's it. But when we think about cultural community and, and how we actually come together, you know, especially when I think about the community I serve, children of immigrants, I think about Russian bathhouses, I think about Japanese onsens, I think about spiritual and religious places, I think about, you know, indigenous healing practices, I think about oral storytelling, it's about creating the environment 
to have that psychological safety amongst every individual where everyone feels comfortable being vulnerable and talking. Um, something I like to say that's that's kind of funny is, is you, you want to get your immigrant dad to talk, take him on a walk. I've never, if I ever want to talk to my dad about something serious, I will just take him on a walk and he will start to open up. Like not, not all of us open up and feel safe in the same way. And so that's something that I really want to challenge um, against Western mental health care is that it's supposed to look a certain way when in reality, maybe it's sharing a meal with your clients. Maybe, you know, sharing food is such a sacred part of so many of our cultures. What a beautiful thing. And yet I'll hear sometimes in Western mental health field, don't let your clients eat. Don't eat with your clients. Don't do that. And it's like, that's actually a really beautiful way to connect with someone, to let them open up, to share a space with them. So it's really about finding the environmental factors that can make and, and create those environments as well, that, that setting as well. That's, great. That's such a good point. And I think it's, it's, it's almost as though it's finding those creative approaches that aren't um, benchmarked by Western standards. I mean, I see this in, in, in not just the Rocky, but in, with my other hats on it, that when um, uh, working with colleagues at the University of Birmingham and I think there is a very traditional model whereby you go into a, a, a clinical style room and you have that intervention and the word mental health scares a lot of particularly Punjabi men and what we find is that when we're putting on forums or or essentially um, creating resources we don't call it mental health we call it emotional support or we call it um, or, or just the topic in hand or even just a space to chat so um, it, it, it's one of those whereby it's not um, putting a specific label, which has already a heightened stigma in Punjabi communities, but actually easing them into it, whereby at the end of it, they even say, oh, actually, I did talk about my mental health. Oh, I am talking about it. And they start to become more and more comfortable with that word. So it, it's, it's kind of um, uh, eas easing people into it. Um, and and I I'd say that rings particularly true for Punjabi men, as I said. Um, but I think a strength of the Punjabi community is that we are very close in terms of generations to one another. Like we respect our grandparents. We, um, you know, grandparents and um, grandchildren are very close. And there's a lot to be shared in terms of knowledge and experiences between those generations. And I think that just needs to be made clear that actually you know, it's okay to talk to your nan or your granddad about what it was like when moving over to England or moving over to the US or Canada or wherever you are and, and how you really felt. And I guess those feelings aren't really shared because it was just the done thing to just go and do it and you had to settle and you just had to acclimatize to your new culture. Um, so I think it's it's about saying it's okay to to talk or, or, or the parents should say to their grandchildren, uh, sorry, parents should say to their children, just go and ask nano or granddad, you know, what it was like, you know, what was their childhood like, what was it like growing up? Yeah, I think, and then adding on for the teenage demographic, teens are in a really unique perspective in that their brains aren't fully developed, they're experiencing these more intense emotions um, as they navigate puberty and all of these different things, so they're really in tune with what they're feeling, um, or their emotions are a little bit bigger and more overwhelming than when you get into adulthood. Teenagers are also extremely aware and alert of their environment, of what's going on, they're really in tune with other people's um, Reaction, reactions and emotions. Um, and they're also, um, the third thing I would mention is that they're growing up with the least amount of mental health stigma and beliefs um, than a lot of other generations. There's this very open-minded, accepting perspective. They're wanting to have these discussions. Um, and I think those three things together put them in a really unique perspective to validate and create space for other people's challenges, mental health um, struggles that they're experiencing, um, even just things in day-to-day -day life. And so being able to be in tune with their own emotions, being really empathetic, being extremely aware of what other people are navigating, the emotions that they might be experiencing, and then being so open-minded um, about the topic of mental health um, and, and challenges that individuals might be experiencing, I think um, is a huge, huge strength in the demographic. That's wonderful. Yes, I'm happy that we're highlighting, um, you know, there, there are a lot of things that we can do to promote mental health and wellness in our lives. We can reach out to 
to uh, others for support, which we're actually going to show a slide with some resources. Um, but we can also just start with looking with what we already what we're bringing and and it and just from what you guys shared, we come with already a lot um, inside. So. I want to go ahead and share the, the slide with the resources for our viewers. And then um, we have one question. If anyone has any questions, um, you can go ahead and type them, uh, send the, your question in, and we will address your question. So these are some resources that you can reach out to. Um, again, as we all, we've all highlighted, it's always great to start in your community. In, in you know local spaces, your churches, your uh, schools, um, you know word of mouth, friends, uh, but these are some other uh, resources that that you can look to for support. We do we did have one question come in uh, about PTSD. The question is, how do you feel PTSD is understood in the South Asian community? Um, this person said a person can be the strong person and bubbly majority of the time, but when the individual is experiencing a trigger, it's seen as being dramatic. Um, the reactions can, can be stem, can be stem into hyper arousal and hypo arousal. Uh, I feel that support is lost during a trigger and causing a person to cycle further. What advice would you give the person dealing with PTSD or helping someone with PTSD? Um, oh, so, so um, I feel like PTSD is not, not, not even existent within the South Asian community, to be honest with you. Uh, one thing I've picked up on is that when a person has trauma and they are South Asian and they're dealing with PTSD, it's very, it's very obvious a lot of the communities and villages will automatically assume that the person is possessed or that it's a lot, it's this other entity taking over them without even realizing, hey, this person had something really traumatic happen. So um, I think it's really important. The only advice I would give for someone dealing with PTSD, especially within the South Asian community, is finding someone that will give them the space to just talk about their story. The first step with PTSD is really just being able to share your story with someone, desensitizing yourself and talking about it over and over again and feeling safe and able to do that. So that would be my main uh, first option. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think it's um, obviously having that space to talk, like you said, is, is quite cathartic and it helps people to kind of um, deal with it in a, in, in, in a way which um, they can put it into a language but I think I guess another way or a couple of other ways that um, you could deal with with it um, is to kind of discuss your symptoms or, or how it, it presents um, with the people around you so they kind of understand how that reaction is and what it is and where it comes from and I think get to know those triggers and help others around you to understand that you know this is how I react to things and that's because of a particular particular issue that's happened and I think it's it's kind of getting to know your triggers and then writing a plan on how you cope with them um, and, and, and having that to hand. So if you are kind of dealing with PTSD, you've kind of got um, your list of your triggers and how you can cope with them. Um, and again, share those with, with, with those around you who are coming into contact with you. Um, and hopefully they can, through time, understand um, kind of what it is and where you're coming from. Yeah, I mean, I don't have much to add other from what Pavan and Sundev said. The only thing I will say that I wish someone had told me um, when I was struggling um, over a decade ago is that I think for a lot of us, and especially in the South Asian community, we are expected to talk to people within our family, brush it under the rug. There's only a certain amount of people that you can actually tell your truth to. Um, and I think it's really important um, for you to just figure out who you actually feel psychologically safe with. It may not be your family members. It may not be your best friend. It may not be whatever, whoever it is. And I think it's really important to understand that psychological safety is perceived. It's decided by the person who's perceiving it. So even if your loved one means really well, wants to help you and you still don't feel 
um, entirely comfortable talking to them, then find someone that you do. And I just want to make that point clear because I think um, in our culture, it is really, there is this expectation of who you can and can't talk to. Um, and it can feel really hard to defy that. But if it's for your mental health, um, I really encourage you to find someone that you do feel really comfortable and safe with to talk to. Thank you, Sahaj. And we have one question, last question. How can a teenager start a mental health club within a school? Where does a person start? Yeah, so I can go ahead and take this one um, and I'll keep it brief so we can answer the other question that just came in. Um, I think there's logistically, I know at my high school, they do a clubs fair in the fall and there's like a deadline that you have to submit an application by. Um, so probably your, I would first go to your guidance counselor and ask um, them as far as logistics. And I also think that that would be a great resource as far as like a staff advisor or a staff sponsor. I know that's pretty common in high schools to have a staff member um, be part of the club. So going to them um, and getting their support um, and asking their advice and being like, hey, has there ever been a mental health club in the, in the past? What was helpful? Um, what are your tips? Um, if you have a teacher that you really connect with and you feel is creates a great environment in their classroom of being accepting and understanding and having conversations and is fun, you enjoy their company. I think having them as a resource as well is another great option just to create an environment where people feel comfortable and safe and want to open up and hang out. Um, I'll also give a little a couple of fun tips as far as creating an environment that people want to go to. We've talked a lot today about different stigmas and even just hearing like having the word mental health plastered on the on the club can deter some people from going if they're nervous about kind of engaging in those conversations. Um, so I think there's some fun ways to frame it as just like a, a space to hang out or you can do different on um, um, club meetings where you're talking about different mental health content. There's so many TV shows and movies that um, um, just dive into so many important mental health topics or stigmas or mental illnesses. So maybe one week you're going to meet and talk about um, like Euphoria is a super um, a show that lots of people love really centers on addiction and teen mental health. Maybe you're all going to dive in and talk about that. Um, or maybe you're going to um, do different themes for like coping skills every week. So you're going to do a self-soothing club, meet club meeting and you're going to like you could have an emotional support animal come one week to talk about animal therapy. So doing things that are enjoyable for people, it's not just you're all going to sit in a room and talk and it's going to be awkward, um, but doing really hands-on activities where people can build these skills, learn coping tools in a way that's accessible, having an environment that people enjoy. Um, and then another thing you can do is have um, guest speakers come in. I think that's another way where um, club members don't feel as pressured to bring their challenges to the table, but they can still listen and learn and kind of increase their awareness about mental health without having to be as involved. Um, so those are a couple ideas as far as what the club can look like, um, as well as the logistics on, on starting that. Thank you, Sadie. And we had one last question come in, which is a, a really big one. How do you help a friend that refuses help? I always start off with simply telling, asking the person, what do you need from me to feel supported? Now, if they don't, if they say, I don't know, or they just really feel like they don't need the help, I'm hoping that with that question, it'll have a delayed effect later on, where then they can sit and really think, what do I really need from people or uh, communities, organizations for me to feel supported? So I'm hoping just by asking that question firsthand, that it can have a trigger some type of response within them. And if you're feeling as though you're being triggered with this person not getting help, if they're struggling with mental health issues, it's important for you to also talk about it and seek out help. A great resource is NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. They have um, great resources for people that are managing relationships with people who are suffering from mental illness as well. Yeah, I would also chime in. There's this amazing um, metaphor, which is used all the time in therapy, but when you're on the airplane and they make all the safety announcements, they always tell parents to put on their own oxygen masks before putting on them on their kids. Because if you put an oxygen mask on a kid and then the parent passes out from lack of oxygen, the kid is left there helpless. They're not able to get off the plane, navigate the situation like it's a toddler left by themselves. Whereas when the parent can put on their own oxygen mask, and even if the child's passed out, they can then put on the oxygen mask for the kid and they're able to effectively navigate the situation. So your ability to help other people is only as, as good as your own mental health. Um, you can't put as much empathy, um, you can't be as 
you're there as a resource, you're not able to connect as much when you're emotionally struggling. So first and foremost, making sure that your mental health is in check so you can be a resource rather than kind of like doing more harm than good if you're struggling and not able to be there for that person um, is always the first thing I say. Um, and then I think, um, it depends, of course, as you get into adulthood, it's a totally different game, but if um, totally different ball game, but for, for high school students talking to a guidance counselor, a teacher, um, if it's uh, maybe a family member that they're close to just kind of raising concerns, um, having more people just be aware of what they're going through can be really helpful. Um, but, but those were the two things that I would add. Yeah, the, the last thing I would just add to that is, is I think, you know, um, if your friend is refusing help, but is willing to talk to you and open up to you and stuff like Pavan said, and Sadie, make sure that you are taking care of yourself. Um, I think with that, it's also really important to recognize that a lot of people's impulse when, when a friend or a loved one is struggling um, is to try to fix it, is to solve the situation, is to make it better. And it's, it's really important for for you to understand where that's coming from, if that's a coping mechanism to kind of absolve you of the discomfort you might be feeling um, and for you to navigate that and deal with that um, while you are trying to be there for your friend and taking care of yourself and, and doing what you can. But it's it's not one person's job to quote unquote fix someone else. And it's important to recognize that people with mental health illness or mental health struggles are not broken and don't need to be fixed. So it really is just um, not about being perfect, but more about just being present. And that, yeah, those are all fantastic points. And I think the only thing I'd probably add to that is something that's worked for me in the past. Um, so that's more about showing my experiences um, is an uh, acronym um, called uh, CLEAR. So the, the C stands for uh, kind of like check the individual is, is, is safe in that space at that moment in time. Are they at risk of suicide? Are they at risk of self-harm? So check, check for signs of these. The L is for um, like listening to their story. So kind of um, just, just sit there um, and just validate how they're feeling. Don't look shocked when they say something that that is is shocking. Um, but ju just sit there, take it in. And, and again, it's a skill in itself. Um, the E is the empathize and inform bit. So it's kind of um, kind of saying to the individual, yes, um, you know, um, you know, reassure them that you're there to listen and offer help and support, but um, make them aware that. They don't need to carry these worries alone and then that you know that there is support out there available um the a is for applying self-help techniques and generally what happens is where i mean there's plenty of resources that offer um you know online that you can find um self-help resources for and generally what i found is that people who um have applied these self-help techniques realize that there's a relief in how the, in their distress so they almost reach a point where they think, actually, I do feel a bit better now and I can feel a bit better. And there are things that I can do to make me feel better. And then the R um, in clear is to refer to a um, um, specialist support. So essentially, once they've realized that I can feel a bit better, um, it's kind of a step by step thing where they then start to think, I would like to feel a lot better. Um, and, and that's where you access the specialized support and the expertise that can help you with that. And I love that you brought that up because that is a DBT acronym, which was what I did, which was really impactful for me um, when I was in Boston doing residential treatment. And I'm going to put a link in the chat to an episode which goes into a bunch of detail on validation and supporting someone who's struggling. Um, and so I just I love when those um, worlds intersect. Brilliant. I love that we're ending on these super concrete tools. I wanted to ask if anyone else had a very concrete practice or tool that you wanted to leave our viewers with as we close out. Gratuity, every morning and every night, just write down something that you're grateful for, even if it's something as small as your eyes opening up in the morning. And try to track your thoughts because your thoughts lead to behavior, which lead to action. So we can be more aware of why we're doing the things we're doing if we are more aware of our thoughts and emotions. So I'm going to leave it with just that. I'm going to also keep it simple and say sleep is number one. When we aren't sleeping well, it is 
detrimental to our mental health, physical health. So we're more emotionally vulnerable, more stressed out, more reactive, our relationship struggles, our um, performance struggles, all of these things just get really difficult to navigate. So making your sleep your number one priority, whether you're struggling with mental health or not, just helps you um, perform your best in life and be present and engage in relationships. And it's extremely helpful if you are struggling with your mental health to decrease your emotional vulnerability and reactiveness um, and any emotions that pop up. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, I think it, it, it probably sounds simple, but it, it's it's a, a multifaceted approach, but um, five ways to well-being. So type that into to Google. So connect, be active, uh, take notice, uh, learn and give. And I guess those are the five ways which you can kind of start reactivating behaviours, which we've all had to stop during the pandemic. And I think it's one of those where we kind of almost need a checklist to kind of get back to some degree of normality as we start to exit the pandemic and, and think to ourselves, what is it that I can do today that is different to what I've done for the last 14 months? <laughs> Thank you. Saha, should you have a final? Uh... I think everyone just summed it up. I was trying to think of a new one. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> Awesome. This is amazing. Thank you all so much for all your great insights and, and your time. And what we're going to um, put that slide back up again with our resources, just to make sure that everyone has access to that. And Sasha, I will hand it back over to you. Thank you, Tamika. And thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you to our incredible panelists. This conversation was so insightful. It was informative. It was empowering. Thank you so much. Um, Sandev, Sadie, Pavan, Sahaj, and our moderator, Tamika, thank you for facilitating this conversation. And also thank you to our Khalsa Aid team, Amrit Paul, Amna, um, Harneet, Garit, and Nahal, whose work behind the scenes made today possible and for it to run smoothly. And we hope that this conversation was beneficial, enjoyable, and comforting for you. And please stay tuned for our upcoming mental health webinars. You can take a look at this resources slide here. You can take a screenshot, a picture, um, or you can also email admin.usa at calsaaid.org and we can send you a copy of it. So take care, everybody. Thank you so much.